You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Happy New Year. Happy Epiphany. Yeah, it's 2022. It is. And that means a new year of Mental Health Monday with yes. Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. We're going to get into our conversation as we continue taking a look at brokenness and looking at uh, vulnerability today. So looking forward to that conversation as well. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. It is time for Mental Health Monday. Checking in with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. Good morning, Heidi. Good morning. Good to be back with you guys. Happy New Year. Happy Epiphany. Mm. And uh, Looking forward to continuing our conversation on your book, Finding Hope from Brokenness to Restoration. And uh, we're going to continue the conversation. Last time we talked about resilience, but it's been a few weeks since we <laughs> chatted about that. So we'll, today we're moving forward into the next chapter on vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Are you ready to yeah, talk about everyone's, vulnerability? Yeah, everyone's favorite topic, right? Everyone wants to talk about vulnerability and how we can be more vulnerable in our relationships. I think this is an incredibly important topic, but it is important to acknowledge that it's pretty uncomfortable, I think, for a lot of people. But God and our relationship with Jesus Christ Christ, I always propose, makes vulnerability possible. And it does make it, I don't want to use the word easier, but I think accessible. Hmm. Well, the vulnerability is kind of a, a, almost a buzzword today mm-hmm. too. So why, and which means there are probably many definitions of vulnerability. Why is it a common um, theme or a buzzword with so many definitions today? That's a good question. Yeah, I think, first of all, just like anything else, there was a time when we didn't talk about it. <laughs> and and this goes in cycles. I don't want to pretend that like suddenly uh, this current generation is like so much better at talking about it because I think you're right. We do a good job at talking about things to get it to a buzzword state so that we can drop it and <laughs> stop talking yeah. about it, which is not necessarily healthy. But I do think thankfully to the work of Brene Brown and other researchers, we do have more like solid scientific data, if you will, about vulnerability. And that's really helpful. At the same time, vulnerability is intimately connected to two concepts, spirituality and connectedness, which are in themselves both very connected. And so people don't necessarily want to talk about things that are like, quote unquote, religious or spiritual, but at face value. And then when you go deeper, vulnerability is those things and it brings out those things. And so I think it's an important topic that we're upfront about the challenges with, like we just said five seconds ago, evidently, I think it's important enough to bring it up again. (laughs) But I think the definitions then, once someone has some solid research, then the research starts to pick up and everybody becomes an expert on vulnerability because they're doing their own work in it or they heard about it on Netflix and, and all of that good stuff. And so being aware of going back to where the solid research lies. And then as Christians, we want to go back to to God's word, to what God says about these topics and be able to investigate further so that we can not discount the research, but see where those things connect to what Mm -hmm. we believe. I feel like, and this, this is slightly unrelated, but I feel like reality TV and social media, the combination of those two things has kind of brought about this this rise in vulnerability. Mm. I I can't, Ooh. like when you say vulnerable, immediately I think of like reality TV shows I've watched, but Ooh, that might be a different conversation. I, I feel <laughs> like that's not what I expected, but I do <laughs> appreciate your insight with that, that maybe that does bring a level of comfort for us in our own vulnerability because we're constantly watching other people be vulnerable, right? In these TV shows and everything. And so I think that's why the definition does matter. What is real vulnerability? And there is certainly Mm -hmm. vulnerability in, you know, burying your soul on the television (laughs) or the internet, if you will. But But what is vulnerability and why does it matter for our actual lives and for our Mm -hmm. actual relationships? I offer a definition in Finding Hope, and this is built off of various research that I read and also scripture that I think really reveals to us the spirituality of vulnerability as well as God's relationship to vulnerability, which is a really complicated theological piece that you can read about in the book. But my definition 
also harkens to Brene Brown's original definition, which has to do with uncertainty and emotional exposure. Those are two really important pieces, uncertainty and emotional exposure. So my definition is an uncomfortable emotion experienced within relationship because of our internal sensation of exposure and our own in uncertainty of others' responses, as well as, and this is a real huge piece of gospel, the natural state of existing in need of God and desiring relationship with. And so I think that spiritual definition of vulnerability, the fact that we do just exist as vulnerable creatures because we are in need of something larger than ourselves. We are in need of something that has control when we do not. I think that's a huge piece of the puzzle that we're not talking about, right, in secular research and in reality TV shows. <laughs> Boy, I, I, I'm... <laughs> Okay. In your book, it, you, you, you briefly mentioned like different types of vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Are there different types? What, what are those different types if there are? You know, I think all of it falls underneath like one giant umbrella, of course, of Mm -hmm. uncertainty and emotional exposure. However, within that, I think that we do experience different kinds, like our vulnerability with God would be one type, that spiritual vulnerability, whether we know who God is, whether we have language for that or not. I also think there's physical vulnerability. I offer a story about how when I was little, I was taught very seriously about stranger danger because I was a very Mm -hmm tiny person. And my dad was always terrified that I would be just so easily picked up, right, off of, I don't know, the street or at the shopping mall or something like that. And so it was a refrain in our family um, that we needed to be careful. But at the same time, we had people in our home all the time. We had lots of friendships, family friendships. My dad would host big fish fries. And so I learned to hold Uh, physical vulnerability in along with safety and uh, being aware of the places around me and being cautious. And so that's, you know, a very physical thing. I think there's intellectual vulnerability. I mean, this is why (laughs) it was so hard for me to apply for my doctorate because, well, guess what? I got rejected like multiple times. You know, there is when you share a new idea with even just your uh, significant other, your spouse or a friend, like there's intellectual vulnerability in that or sharing knowledge that's vulnerable. Financial vulnerability, you know, you set up an IRA and you hope that it does well so that you can retire at some point, a point of privilege, right? Because other people have final financial vulnerability that looks like, what am I going to eat tomorrow? or tonight. So I think there is vulnerability in all of our spaces that wellness touches. You know, we might go back to that uh, wellness wheel, if you will, or other expressions of what wellness is and see how we're vulnerable in each of those spaces. And that might be really helpful for us to understand our relationship with vulnerability. So what is that common, the common thread, the common experience between all of these different types of vulnerability? Yeah, let's talk about the concept of risk, because I think that's really huge. I think sometimes in the Christian church, there is a pendulum swing with risk, especially. So we get these ideas that risk is either horrible, like we should never take it because God is peace and solid and he doesn't, you know, express risk or whatever. Or the other side of it where we should just risk everything, you know, and we should not be cautious and throw it to the wind because God asks from us to give our all. And so being aware that maybe there's a place for both of those things in our faith and in our life and in our relationship with God is good. I propose in the book that God, who is not vulnerable because he's God, right, instead offers us his vulnerability And that is actually what makes our risk-taking possible and safer for us. So if you think about the fact that God doesn't have to have a relationship with us, right? But he offers that to us at the risk of us saying, no, thank you. (laughs) At the Mm -hmm. risk of the entire world falling into sin. Like so much risk on God's part that he didn't have to offer. At the same time, he does remain invulnerable in many ways. And so I think diving into the depth of that scripturally is really helpful for us to understand what kind of God we have always helps us understand our own place in this world as well and our ability to exist in that. And so 
I think emotional exposure is huge in that for people. Emotions are one of the most vulnerable pieces of our life, especially in our culture where sadness is not welcome so often. Angry is not welcome often, especially in the Christian church. Um, Fear is often, right, not welcome as well. So emotional vulnerability is a really big piece of the biblical puzzle. And God when Adam and Eve sin, when they fall short, what does he do? He enters into that and asks them questions and brings them out of hiding. And so he offers that same thing to us then too. In our emotional vulnerability, he offers us to come out of hiding with him. And then because we can do that with him, we can do that with other people. We're taking a look at vulnerability in Finding Hope from Brokenness to Restoration with Dignus Heidi Gaiman. And we have more to chat about in on this topic in her book. And we'll continue that conversation right here on Mental Health Monday on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. You're a miracle. You know that, right? A living, breathing, one-of-a-kind miracle. You were created to stand apart, to share your gifts in the service of others, to make an uncommon impact in a common world. And at Concordia University, it's our mission to help you do that, to live uncommon. To learn more about Concordia, go to cuw.edu. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golsa. It is Mental Health Monday. We are chatting with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman, taking a look at finding hope from brokenness to restoration, and today particularly digging into the topic of vulnerability. So I'll just be vulnerable. Where would you like to go next, <laughs> Heidi, with this topic? Since I've been asking all kinds of questions, uh, we've been asking questions. Is there a particular point that you want to dig into on this this topic today? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I wanted to jump back a little bit to the terrible definitions you guys brought up at the at the top <laughs> of the hour, like the the terrible Thank definitions. You. And it's funny because I had, you know, stepping away from the book and in writing a different book right now, I'd kind of forgot about how many terrible definitions there are. But during the break, I was thinking about the fact that so many of them reflect on being attacked or harm or wounded. Like it reserves vulnerability for those really physical experiences, if you will, that you can see. Like you can, like there's a physical cut, a wound, if you will. And I, think you can probably guess why I'm bringing this up, that most vulnerability is really invisible. We can't look around us and see people's gaping wounds. You know, if we did, if we could visually see the emotional and especially relational and spiritual vulnerabilities of people, I think we'd be overwhelmed. I think we'd be shocked when really, I think if we went into conversations and relationships more aware of especially those three categories, emotional, relationship, emotional, relational, and um, spiritual vulnerabilities, I think our relationships that would already give them more solid ground in, Mm -hmm. in having eyes wide open, that we are vulnerable people in those things. And so there's that piece of uncertainty. I walk into everything I do as a human being a little bit uncertain. I'm not God. (laughs) I am Heidi Gaiman. I am a person. I'm 42. I have some experience. I don't have every experience. I have some knowledge. I don't have all knowledge. And unlike God, I do need protection. I do need care. I do need tenderness and patience and compassion. And so when we bring those into our relationships, we allow for more vulnerability And vulnerability feeds vulnerability, which feeds good mental health. When I offer my vulnerability to you, as we're doing, even in this program, right? Like we're sharing some stories and we're laughing and we're talking, then you feel free to share some vulnerability with me. And it's like a bid for connection too in that way then. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I just had a question and I totally lost my train of thought. So I was was like listening so intently. I like how you point out that with all of those terrible definitions that are more physical, that it it makes us feel like we can do something about it. Mm. But can we actually do something about it? You know, this is where I, you know, again, I hearken back to the work of Brene Brown, mostly because 
she's done so much research in this area, not because she has every answer and she is always correct. You know, I think that that's one thing I enjoy about her work is that she's vulnerable herself in saying, mm -hmm. I don't have all the answers, but she does just present research that's been done of humankind, right? So you have thousands of people telling their story. What are some similar themes? Um, and in that, I think she in one of her books, Steering Greatly presents different armors that we put on against vulnerability. Like we have defense mechanisms and and we all lean towards certain ones that make us feel extra cozy. And that's very common across humankind. The one thing I like to point out, I think we've talked about this once before on the show, is that we have a different armor, literally a different armor that we're offered in scripture. <laughs> this is mind blowing to me that God is like, oh yes, I have an answer for that, of course. But that, you know, we have Christ clothed. He's like put his clothes of righteousness on us. And so vulnerability at its core is about nakedness scripturally. You know, in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, they noticed they were naked. They noticed that they were physically, yes, naked, but also emotionally um, and relationally and spiritually naked. And so God comes into that and he offers them uh, better clothes <laughs> instead of what they try to fashion for themselves, their armor of fig leaves that they put on. He gives them animal skins. And then in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the death and resurrection, he gives them clothes of righteousness. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think every day I need to be reminded of that because I need to remember that I have a God who comes to me in my vulnerability instead of me trying to clothe myself with that vulnerability. And so then he also gives us more. God gives more grace every time. And we have the word of God. We have the sword of the spirit. We have prayer and relationships with each other so that we can go walk out into this world. And we are released. Here's the huge piece. And I know I, I think I'm taking over this podcast at this point with my words, but I feel so passionately about this. We are released from shame in that. And wow, is that a vulnerability game changer. When I am not standing in shame constantly in my life because God has lifted that from me, then I can be vulnerable with the people in my life and I can offer them that same thing instead of handing out shame like candy, which is sometimes what we do when we haven't dealt with our stuff and we haven't dealt with ourselves before God. As Lutherans, we like to make distinctions. <laughs> Um, that seems to be something we do frequently. So are there important distinctions we should make regarding vulnerability, particularly when we're looking at vulnerability from a biblical worldview or with mm -hmm. a biblical worldview? Yeah, I think it's so interesting because I do think culturally it's early enough in the vulnerability conversation that I would like people to just feel comfortable having the conversation. You know, I do you think there are some distinctions? And that's why I write about it in the book. And you'll read about it in all my work, right? On my study of Song of Song, Altogether Beautiful, there's quite a bit about vulnerability and the interaction of shame and grace. And then in The Mighty and the Mysterious, which is a study of Colossians, there's a whole lot about vulnerability in community and connectedness, whether in the body of Christ or in our our actual like communities around us. I, I don't know how to talk about the Bible without talking about vulnerability, because like I said, vulnerability is spiritual. And so, I mean, I think, again, some of the distinction would be that we really are only truly free from the struggle with vulnerability in Jesus Christ. Like we're our shame is only completely lifted in Jesus Christ, but it's called finding hope for a reason. We still live in brokenness. Sometimes that's really hard to see. And so brokenness will weigh in our, our families. It will weigh in our physical and our mental health. That's not a place of shame that we should have because everybody has it. We all have junk. We all have brokenness. But we can be vulnerable because Jesus, we know, has lifted those things. And again, we need people to remind us of that. We need kindness and compassion and gentleness to remind us of that. And I would say that that's the distinction that we have as Christians is we feel like, not that we have a different vulnerability, but I would say that and this sounds really presumptuous, but I do think there's a fuller vulnerability in having relationship with the God of the universe without shame. And I want that for everyone. 
And that's a piece of the gospel is that there is a place to exist without shame. And his name is Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Yeah. As you were talking about living in vulnerability as community, I had just written that question down. <laughs> well, how, how do we then move in this vulnerable space and live in this vulnerability as community, as, as the body of Christ? Mm, that's a really good uh, question. I'm going to offer some real practical things here, but off the top, I want to say be trauma-informed. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I think that's a really an important first step, and we're really not good at this yet in the body of Christ. There's a lot of hurt and a lot of excusing hurt, and I think it's vulnerable to deal with hurt. It's vulnerable to deal with actual trauma and abuses, especially in places that are supposed to be God's, the body of Christ, and in his churches, and, and even his houses of worship, um, and his clergy, and all of that stuff. But it is time Because when we are vulnerable about those things and discuss them openly and honestly, then God does restore, God does heal. But when we cover them, that's fake. That is the fig leaves, right? That bring shame. And so I do think that is step one. Be trauma-informed in our places and spaces. Understand that people have been hurt and that they need that hurt attended to by God and by His grace, that that is that hurt is the law in their lives. And so often we need to step in with the gospel. And so working through that, it's more complicated than that, obviously. But I would Mm -hmm. say that's one thing I notice as a deaconess and as a clinician, a whole lot of spiritual hurt and trauma out there. And so being aware of that and then also physical, emotional abuses and trauma as well, verbal, all that good stuff, all that terrible stuff. That was not a good phrase. Vulnerability 101 right there with Heidi Gaiman. So then the other piece I would say is know some spaces of vulnerability because not everywhere in a broken world will be spaces of vulnerability. So I would recommend identifying one to three people to start with that are your vulnerable people that you can be vulnerable with, and then one to three people that you can also offer vulnerability to as a space. And those might overlap, right? Like my spouse in particular, in my particular marriage, not everyone's marriage, but my marriage, my husband is both a person I can be vulnerable with and that offers vulnerability. I can offer that to him. So he's going to overlap. But other friends, I might offer that to them, but I may not be able to get that from them and vice versa. So naming, I guess, those people in your life, I think is one way to start. Naming those people in your church is also another good way to start because goodness knows, I think we're all familiar with the fact that not everybody is a person we can be vulnerable with in our churches too. We'll get to that part in Finding Hope. Okay. Don't worry. There will be the church <laughs> chapter. And we continue the conversation next week here on Mental Health Monday and the Coffee Hour. It's been a great chat. Heidi, thank you so much for helping us dig into the topic of vulnerability today. Absolutely. You can always find more on vulnerability too at HeidiGaiman.com. Very good. And you can find her book from Concordia Publishing House, Finding Hope from Brokenness to Restoration at uh, cph.org. Always good to chat with you. Have a great week, Heidi. Thanks. See ya. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Bolseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.